those principles and apply them. And so we probably have to do some more work around this, this context question, um, but we're saying the human organization to be optimized would be one that is decentralized, resilient, has effective feedback loops, and is where individuals are lar largely autonomous and are treated as equals. Um, so any organization that you know is, is seeking those um, values, we would want to be able to provide them um, with these with nature's deep principles. Uh, so that's the those are the highlights. <laughs> I just have a couple of comments on the structure of your team. It sounds like you have pretty much the necessary components except you're lacking an engineering perspective. Uh, several of you are, are personal, own your own business, so you have a business perspective and you ha certainly have a science perspective in your, um, in your social science and in your biology, so that's very helpful. Um, and my guess, my feeling is, is that um, a lot of times the processes that designers use is, is uh, somewhat parallel to the process that engineers use, so I don't think that you'll have any problems with your team structure. Um, your your uh, function is extremely broad, so as you get biological literature, it may become overwhelming, and you may have to narrow those down and just pick some, or maybe not. You might pick enough, you might get enough, um, if you're enthusiastic enough to address all those issues, uh, it will be a great um, end result of your project. But in as you go through it, if you find that you're overwhelmed, you may want to narrow that down. <laughs> On your context, this statement is actually um, a, <clears throat> um, a conclusion. You're actually coming to a conclusion that a human organization, um, this is what it needs to be optimized. And basically what you're saying is that for a, the best human system, you need to use a lot of life's principles. So uh, the, I would encourage you to go back and say, it, it, and especially since your function is so broad, to say, um, ask the question about your context. Um, do you want to narrow it down? Do you want to put some um, boundaries around uh, what you're going to look at and how you're going to apply it. So, um, and if you want to discuss that further, we can we can talk about that later. Um, there is a there is a uh, biomimicry group in the next two year cohort who are studying organization, and they've shared some of their information with me, so I can give that to you. They're basically looking at uh, the resilience part of keeping an organization. Um, up and running. So um, some of that we can share with uh, with you. Great. Okay. You. Sure. Let's go on. Um, oh, these, this was your other, but you already went through this information, your yes. model. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. And how about someone from the team adapters to go through your um, context and function in, in context? Uh, Is there someone from the adapters team who wants to speak? Maybe you could raise your hand. I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to call on Lynn. Okay. Lynn, go ahead and talk. Okay, hello. Yeah, we um, hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Great. So for the adapters, we as we try to work through the function, we realized we needed to change our challenge somewhat. So we changed our challenge to how does nature inform human capacity to adapt to climate change. We basically narrowed it down some. Um, and in the discussions that we had, we ended up coming up with a function that was stated uh, around thriving within change. Uh, and it's pretty simple, so I'd love your feedback. Great. It sounds like um, you've narrowed it down quite a bit. I know your challenge was a combination of two challenges that were identified, but I think you'll find a lot of species information that you can use for the other part of your challenge. Um, as far as striving within change, it, it is your function. Um, it might be hard to use those particular terms in Ask Nature, but certainly um, it might be you might want to check uh, in the literature adapting to change, and um, then you'll find strategies. Because 
uh, there may be there may be strategies where organisms uh, use a strategy and they die anyway, and that would be valuable information. Um, this strategy does not work because one of the things we look at in the biomimicry methodology is how does nature do it and how does nature not do it. And so um, I would just maybe make a slight change instead of thriving within change, I would say how do they uh, adapt or um, deal with change or something like that because you might find the solution space to be both sides of it, things not to do as well as things to do. So but you're suggesting adapt within change? That would be one way to look at it, right? Or how does it um, deal with? I'm trying to think of a better verb, but I'll look at the I'll look at the taxonomy again and um, and see if there's a better word. But um, my point is, you just don't want to find organisms who are successful with climate change. You also want to find the organisms who are unsuccessful, who have tried a strategy and it didn't work. And I don't know if that's in the literature, but um, some organisms, for example, the I know I've read several uh, articles about the pika. They're they're at the they're already at a very high altitude, so some adaptation occurs by uh, organisms moving to a higher altitude, to moving to a you know different uh, ecosystem, whereas the pika cannot because it's already there's no place for it to move, for example. So um, does it have other adaptation strategies, or is that adaptation strategy a dead end? And, and uh, so that would be valuable information for your team to look at both thriving and dying <laughs> um, during change. So uh, that's good. It keeps it broad. You're not just focusing on climate change. You're, co you're focusing on all kinds of changes, which could help us inform how we would deal with the, with the unknown of climate change. So good work. All right, how about, um, this is um, Communicate. Who would like to speak about the function and context of the, of the um, Communicate team? You want to raise your hand? Okay, Deirdre, can you talk? Deirdre, are you out there? Okay. If there's no one on the team who wants to present, well, I she raised her hand, but it, I don't think it's um, working. Or for some reason, I can't unmute her, so I'm going to turn over to John Frank. Um, go ahead, John. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, am I coming through? Yes, we hear you. Excellent. Um, I don't know if you received it. I just emailed the slide we were going to talk from. Uh, I, did, I did. Do you want me to show that slide? Uh, you can if it's if it's easy. If if it's not, I'm happy to just describe it. I um, I'm just going to turn it over to myself. And okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And I don't know if if, uh, if if Deidre can can chime in too. Can you unmute both of us at the same time? I can. Let's see if it works. Yeah, let's give that a try. And uh, oh, she. I think she's just trying to call in right now. So she needs to put in her your the audio pin, Deirdre, that you should see under the audio box. And. Um, under the access code, there should be an audio pin, and then I'll be able to unmute you. But go ahead and start, John. Okay. Um, for our challenge, uh, we wanted to focus on how nature communicates uh, and what we can learn from nature about how to how we can communicate sustainability. And more specifically, kind of drilling down into the specifics of our uh, context, uh, what we want to try to achieve is uh, to come get some answers to uh, how can we communicate about uh, achieving zero waste, or how do natural systems turn waste into food? Uh, the uh, 
context that we're working within is the uh, 2,500 year-round residents in Grand Canyon National Park who have varying degrees of commitment and participation in the many wonderful things that the park is trying to provide in the way of, of services and incentives for uh, recycling and and waste di diversion of waste from from landfills. Um, so ideally, the, the 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 goal or the function we'd like to reach would be uh, something closer to a zero waste community. There, just focusing on the the, the year round residents. Uh, we've had some very interesting conference call conversations about. Uh, the ebb and flow of material and waste through the systems and how some of that ties in with uh, concepts uh, or could potentially tie in with concepts like uh, scavengers and, and uh, uh, you know, turning things that people would discard into things that other people could use, uh, as well as the discussion of some of the dynamics of, of what generates the waste material that flows into the system now and is perceived as waste and actually is becomes waste in terms of uh, generating trash to landfills. All kinds of interesting cultural dynamics as it relates to the relationships between the uh, park service professional staff and concessionaires and contractors and uh, so forth. So uh, we, we have our work cut out for us. Is, uh, Deirdre, are, are you on yet? Do you have anything you want to add or, or correct for that matter? I think that she, um, I just sent her um, an, um, um, a little chat message. Deirdre, if you type in your audio pin, which is pound five five pound, I should be able to um, give, unmute you, but um, let me try again. Yeah, it's not working for some reason. Okay, I think John gave us a good overview. Okay. I have a couple of comments. Um, it sounds like you're looking at two different functions. You're looking at how to communicate around a specific issue, and your context would be around the issue of zero waste and recycling and, and uh, having a zero waste community. How does nature recycle or how does nature achieve a zero waste community is a separate function. So I would encourage your group to decide if you want to research both um, functions. How does nature recycle all materials and how does nature communicate? There would be two different um, functions that you would be looking for strategies. Or you can say our, our function is how does nature recycle all materials and how can we best communicate about that issue um, would be um, a, a more uh, comprehensive overview and provide a solution space that would work really well for the Grand Canyon. So um, creating a zero waste community uh, it isn't really the function that you're looking at. So how does nature recycle all materials? And how does nature communicate? Um, and, and a lot of times in biomimicry methodology, you look at um, organisms on two completely different functions, and you can combine them in your answer. So um, you can research both of them. It sounds like a, a big job, but it you're, you're, sounds like you're up for it. So. Great, thank you. OK, so let's go back. You want to give me back control of the? I suppose. I suppose, OK. okay. <laughs> okay. All right, you got it. So part of your homework was um, getting to know function. And I don't know if anybody had any questions about that. I did get an email from uh, someone who wanted to know the answer to this one. And I thought we could go over it to maybe clarify a little bit. So the 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 um, the question was, you know, since the new housing development was built, we needed to add another wastewater treatment plant. And uh, what I 
answered in response was, you know, how does nature purify water? How does nature remove uh, contaminants from water? But then when I was laying in bed one night, I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, I didn't go to the next step of asking why many times. And in this case, for the wastewater treatment plant, you would ask why. Why are you removing contaminants? Well, because we use water to flush waste. And why do we use water to flush waste? Well, because we designed this really poor system like 200 years ago. And, um, you know, I found this on the internet, a little example of uh, what it takes to, to uh, actually uh, wastewater entering a wastewater treatment plant and all the things that are needed to do to remove those contaminants and then put those contaminants back on the land, as opposed to something like using a composting toilet where you could directly put that waste onto your land uh, in some way. So um, in this particular um, example on your function homework sheet, uh, did anyone come up with um, other answers or other comments on, on this one or on any of the other ones on your function uh, homework sheet? So you can raise your hand if you have a comment or, or a answer or question. No hands. Okay. So just just remember, you know, the part about really drilling down um, because we don't really want to build another wastewater treatment plant. Nature doesn't collect all its waste in one place and then treat it and move it around with high energy processes. Um, you know, it, it would never use water to remove um, bodily waste from a system. It would just find a way to use it in its current form, it would be my point. Okay. So our eyesight. And again, you know, uh, just a reminder that, you know, reconnecting with nature means actually being in nature and, and recognizing how nature is doing something. So biomimicry, as we we're learning is about using nature's ideas to yield physical and material benefits that we as humans want. Uh, and it's not a direct extraction, but rather indirect borrowing from nature. And it serves us quite well to come up with this innovations inspired by nature. Uh, the elegance and inherent appeal in nature readily rises to the surface without much interaction from us at all because it's part of our um, genetic material. So invariably, this uh, delight creates a humanistic connection as the joy of discovery and pleasure provides an emotional connection to nature. And maybe it is reawakening our biophilic genes uh, that we, we have uh, developed over many years of, of connecting with nature. And it's a new way of looking at nature and gleaning some insights into how life works. So by doing so, it not only helps us as humans understand life from a biological perspective, it also provides a new way to connect with the natural world. And it's this connection which makes biomimicry much more than simply a different way of looking at nature. And I hope that all of you have been visiting your eyesight and relearning how to observe nature with a childlike curiosity. And um, I wondered, I can share with you a, just a short little experience I had. I was um, just come back yesterday from the San Luis Valley, and I was down at the Great Sand Dunes meeting with the park over some issues. And um, the creek was running down in front of the Great Sand Dunes. And it was interesting. I was just listening and watching and observing. And these two little kids just came running by me, and they were just screaming with delight, and they said, oh, I just love the great sand dunes. And they were just playing in the mud and rolling in the dirt. And I thought, I used to do that. Oh, <laughs> come on, I'm just standing here watching them. <laughs> but um, would anyone else like to share anything from their eyesight that you've been that's especially um, important or, or interesting this time of year? I don't see any hands yet, Murray. Okay. Well, keep looking out there at your eyesight, and um, we'll have a lot of opportunities to share once we're together um, in September. So the next uh, part of this webinar is to share some examples. And this, um, what I'm going to do now is to share one example um, 
of technology, and then we're going to do a lot of in-depth um, analysis of the great sand dunes uh, work of how nature provides portable hydration. So I'm going to use that as my second example throughout the webinar. So learning from nature, um, learning from our own lungs, how to sequester carbon. And studying the way human lungs work is, in a, is inspiring new technologies that remove carbon dioxide from sources like food stacks. And our lungs have three major adaptations which give them their carbon dioxide removal effectiveness. Um, we have a super thin membrane that allows CO2 to travel across and out of our bloodstream. We have an enormous surface area. And as you can see from this um, uh, illustration of the human lung, that um, it's, if it was laid out, um, if the surface area was laid out flat, it would be 70 times your body surface. So uh, you can see all the surface area, the way our lungs are, are developed. And we also have a specialized chemical translator. It's called carbon anhydrase, which allows CO2 to be removed from our bloodstream thousands of times faster than possible uh, without that enzyme. And in tests by a company called Carzo Enzyme Incorporated, human-made filters inspired by the way our lungs work remove 90% of the CO2 traveling through flu stacks. Um, other technologies based on the carbonic anhydrase enzyme found in animals such as mollusks have successfully transformed CO2 into limestone, which can either be stored or used as a building supply material. And I Googled this to see what the status of that was and found an article in the Science Daily um, that the uh, researchers in Wyoming report develop a, develop development of a low carbon filter, low cost carbon filter that can remove the 90% of carbon dioxide um, gases. And a little bit of detail around that is colleagues at, micro, at Wyoming's soft material laboratories cite the need for pressing, the pressing need for simple, inexpensive new technologies to remove carbon dioxide from smokestack gases. And coal-burning electrical power plants are the major source of greenhouse gases, and control measures are probably, hopefully, going to be required in the future. And this study describes a new carbon dioxide capture process called the carbon filter process designed to meet this need. And it uses a simple, low-cost filter with porous carbon, carbonaceous sorbent, and that is the carbonic anhydrase enzyme um, that works at low pressures. And modeling data and laboratory tests suggest that the device works better than existing technologies at a fraction of the cost. And the Department of Energy has put a large amount of money into developing this technology. So let's look, let's do a short review of integrating biology into design. Um, what we looked at um, last month was the seeds of biomimicry, the ethos, the reconnect um, using uh, observations of nature and the emulate. And we also discovered that emulating um, by integrating biology to, into design <coughs> had three phases, the scoping, creating, and evaluating phase. Uh, we looked at an overview of how Interface Carpet uses the integrating biology into design approach. And uh, we've gone through the homework of identifying the function and context of your challenge. So many times when we have a challenge, we just jump to the solution space right away. That's really, um, we want the solutions. We want to know what the answer is, and we have ideas. And um, if you, have, if you have done that, if you have come and say, oh, I have a great idea, <laughs> what I would recommend is that you make notes of those, because those are very valuable. And as we saw in the interface carpet example, you go around the process many times in many different ways. It's not just a linear process. So just as a review, the scoping phase uh, is what we've already gone through. It's the, the identifying the function and the context. Um, and now we're going to be looking at the creating phase, which is the glamorous stage of design. Options are explored. It's where we do brainstorming. 
And we'll be looking at the evaluation phase. Um, it's used to determine if the goals and the metrics are met. So in the creating phase, um, glimmers of ideas are stretched, sketched on napkins during lunch. Options are explored. Concepts fleshed out. People just come up with lots of new ideas. Uh, brainstorming ideas and seeking inspiration also fall into this category. And in the evaluation phase, it's much less dramatic and unfortunately is sometimes left until the very end and given only a token effort, maybe even just looking at only the financial analysis. Evaluation is used to determine if your goals and metrics were met. It also is used to test the feasibility of a concept or idea or to solicit and incorporate feedback on the success of an implementation. It's also the place where you check to see if the life principles are being followed. A very simple description of the, of the design process would be to proceed through scoping, then creating, and then evaluation. But this unrealistic route implies that when one phase is finished, a designer moves to the next phase. So in solving your challenge, you may reevaluate the decisions that you made in the scoping phase once you go through the creating and evaluating phase. You may find that you're taking on too much, your function is too broad or not broad enough, or you might find that your context doesn't really capture what you need or that you can't find the solutions given your context and you need to change it a little bit. So projects are not really just simple that you go through one phase to the other. In reality, design is very fluid, and these categories of scoping, creating, and evaluating are not a set of iterative steps with instructions, but the different components that need to happen throughout the design process. So we looked at this um, <coughs> diagram um, that's meant to be less discipline dependent and instead intended to help designers practice biomimicry while designing anything. And emulation is not a common word. In biology, integrating biology into design, we use emulation to mean bringing in the principles, patterns, strategies, and functions that are found in nature to help us inform our design. And within this process, there are three areas in which biology is most informative to the design process. The scoping phase, the creating phase, and the evaluation phase. So these phases, while the terminology may not be identical to how you phrase them for your particular discipline, they really are apparent in all design processes. So um, let's look at um, the creating phase. So um, it's an exercise in pursuing creative design solutions for your challenge. Um, we, we find out how to access biology using different lenses. And this information was given to you uh, with your initial eyesight exercise, the different lenses that you can use to look at biology. We um, look at the importance of abstracting biological patterns once we find the strategies that nature uh, uses to perform your function. And we're, uh, here we also learn techniques for abstracting design principles. So in this webinar, I'm just going to go through the stages of creating and the stages of evaluation. And next month, we're going to be learning how to abstract those deep design principles once you've had a chance to find out, find some biological literature. So creating is the high profile piece of designing. It results in a new human product or design. And just to note that um, humans are the only organism on the planet that invents something and then decide what to use it for. Um, one example is um, uh, the nuclear reaction. We've, we've figured out how to do a lot around um, nuclear energy before we ever decided what to do with the technology. Other organisms in nature only invent something if they have already have a need for the function. So that's one thing that's given, 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 gotten us into a lot of problems as humans and also resulted in a lot of really stupid products on the market. I'm sure you can think of some that really aren't that um, important. So designing, uh, the creating phase is creating something new, putting things together in a new way, making and inventing. 
The ideation phase of creating is the most fun and traditionally involves a combination of exploring how others have solved that opportunity or challenge and brainstorming new solutions. Um, every discipline that needs and generates solutions ultimately has some sort of creating phase in their process, and biomimicry dovetails quite easily into this phase. And I thought about how I do it, mostly at EPA, maybe other people do it differently, but at EPA we usually have a brainstorm session where people just think of their best ideas and then we multi-vote is how we go through the evaluation phase. So we really don't bring any deep thinking. Uh, we don't identify our function or usually we have some goal for the project but it's not uh, labeled in terms of a function and we really don't uh, have a clear understanding of our context. And you can see how this approach would not be the best model as it skips the work done in the scoping and the evaluating phase to come up with, with a, a solution that we already know about. So essentially by asking one more additional question in the ide ideation phase, na namely how would nature solve this problem, the idea pool is enhanced with a suite of novel strategies for the issue at hand. So instead of relying on human cleverness alone, integrating biology into the design in the creating phase means being inspired by successes found in nature. And the attraction of biomimicry is the hope and idea of being proactive, of taking steps towards the goal of fitting in here on the planet Earth. So in integrating biology into design is a three-step process. Uh, discovering ideas. Uh, basically, that will align with your function and your context. Um, then you abstract the deep design principles, which we'll work on next month. And then modeling the solution after those principles. And we'll do a lot of that work when we're at the sand dunes um, in September, once we have extracted those design principles. So from here, designers do brainstorming based on the design principles abstracted from the natural solutions. And we're just adding one more step to this process. We're asking how nature performs those functions. And creative ideas may be combined, uh, may be combinations of the solutions from multiple organisms. So humans, for example, they want their functions to perform quickly, but nature usually does not have that constraint. Um, so for example, nature recycles all materials. But a leaf can lay on the ground for a really long time until it's recycled into the ecosystem. Humans want recycling to occur quickly, so we may extract one idea for recycling all materials from one organism or several organisms, but take an idea on how to speed up the process from other organisms and combine the two to find a solution to quick recycling, as an example. So um, how to integrate biology into the design in the creating phase. So the first thing we do is we biologize the question. It, and that means to take a human need or function and rephrase it so that it answers, the answer may be found in biology. Then we discover the natural models by, you know, looking outside, maybe asknature.org, for example. Then we abstract those deep design principles and translate the biological mechanism into a design principle. We emulate the best model. And then finally, and not minorly, <laughs> we thank nature for providing for us for that inspiration. So in integrating, uh, biology into design, what biology is really incorporated. So in the creating phase, all of biology has the potential to be incorporated. Of course, the selection criteria that begins with function and context limit the pool of up to 100 million species and their strategies to a more manageable few dozen strategies. In addition to organism-specific strategies, General principles from ecology, cellular biology, biochemistry, and more can be included. Um, I'm reading a really interesting book right now written by some engineers at the University of Wisconsin on how to, how to um, generate materials that um, are self-healing, self-lubricating, and self-cleaning. And they looked at the concepts behind thermodynamics in order to discover those deep principles in nature. 
and, but that, that's all the further they went. Then they used traditional uh, heat beaten treat methods to manufacture those materials. They didn't look further into the biology of how nature does it other than that general principle. So biology, as you may remember, is written in textbook as it's written in textbooks, might have some direct application, but more commonly it's an abstracted design principle from biology, from specific organisms that will be applied during this phase. And life principles can also be added to the creating phase as an ideation tool. And we've seen team organizing, organize really start to bring in those life principles in their very beginning, um, that they want things like feedback loops um, into their design. <coughs> So biologize, it means to take a human need or function and rephrase it so that an answer may be found in biology. <coughs> Excuse me. So biologize is a term that the biomimicry group made up that describes the process of turning a human challenge or question into a question that might be appropriately asked of biology. The biologized question is an important starting point that focuses project challenges. And having a focus helps direct research and discovery as well as the rest of the design process. So following through a scoping phase in which the function and context are clearly defined, it is then possible to biologize those two scoping results. So you'd ask the question, how would nature do x, given your function, where x is the function, and furthermore, how would nature do X given Y and Z, where Y and Z are the context constraints? So the addition of Y and Z are critical as you move through the next phase into the discover phase. So that context that you've identified is really important. Think of it as a Google search on a topic of your choosing. Without modifying terms, the Y and the Z in this case, your search would be too broad to be manageable. How does nature communicate? That's a pretty broad search with hundreds, if not thousands, of viable solutions. It's better to ask, again, depending on how you've framed your context, how does nature communicate across long distances? Or how does nature communicate without using sound? Or how does nature communicate between two very different organisms? And we've heard the communicate team uh, define their context is how does how does how can we communicate among the 2,500 employees at the Grand Canyon? So that really narrows it down. You're not trying to communicate to three million visitors, or you're not trying to communicate to the world. You're really narrowing your down in your context. So you get the idea. Each of those steps helps narrow your search without being too restrictive. But again, you don't want to be so restrictive that there's no answer possible. So something like, how does nature communicate across long distances without using sound between two very different organisms at night without any signal loss <laughs> would be far too restrictive a question. So a balance needs to be made as you get more practice at this, you'll begin to develop a sense of really what works uh, to get your search narrowed but not uh, too, too narrowed. And again, if you're struggling to biologize your function, the biomimicry taxonomy can be useful in identifying the terminology, both the verb and the context, that will make sense when framing the question, how would nature do this? Um, there's also an interesting perspective gained from biologizing the inverse question. The answer to the question, how would nature not do this? can also be as informative to the design process as what would nature do. And we talked a little bit about that with the uh, ADAPT team, uh, the adapters. You know, how would nature, uh, how has nature failed at adapting uh, might be, might provide some valuable information. So I sent to you the um, case study for the Great Sand Dunes, and um, we can go through that a little bit uh, as, a po as, as uh, in, in this um, area. So plastic beverage bottles are a large waste stream at the Great Sand Dunes, and they wanted to use biomimicry to help reduce the cost of, uh, and the waste of disposal. So during the scoping phase, it was discovered that 90% of the visitors do not travel more than 40 feet from their car. And that became a very important con 
context for their uh, solution space because you didn't have to provide portable hydration very far. So their function, provide portable hydration, informs their question asked during the creating, how does nature provide portable hydration? The, the group did research, abstracted some design principles, and categorized life strategies for potential incorporation. Now, some of the strategies were rejected because they won't work at the scale of the project, and some would not be applicable for that context. For example, we found that organisms in the San Luis Valley, uh, a lot of them hydrate through the food they eat. So it really wasn't applicable. We weren't going to propose uh, vending machines with watermelons or with oranges in it. <laughs> um, so we weren't going to use that strategy because it did not fit the, the solution space. But we also found out some other strategies that no organisms climb on the dunes during the hot part of the day. So that became important in reducing the need for hydration. And that organisms seek shade to reduce their need for hydration. And so from here, the team did brainstorming based on the design principles abstracted from natural solutions. Uh, we created, we um, combined some of the solutions from multiple organisms. And the solution for the Great Sand Dunes was to use this biological information to develop a solution that was based on what the natural system does. And um, you know, again, we added some of the life's principles to the creating phase, such as nature recycles all materials. So in this case with the Great Sand Dunes, uh, we had this entire webinar series during a three-day meeting at the Great Sand Dunes. So, uh, we were not able to uh, access a lot of biological information and bring it to the workshop and then abstract the deep design principles. What we had was we had the two biologists who knew the ecosystem really well, and they provided strategies off the top of their head of how nature deals with providing hydration. And so we did not do a step where we abstracted the deep design principles. We just did a very shallow, more shallow overview and used that to formulate a better solution. So as part of your homework, you're asked to develop a story about some part of your process so far. And this information will be used to tell your story in a case study for the class, um, after the class. Um, for example, as part of the Great Sand Dunes workshop, the superintendent of the, of the Sand Dunes, Art Hutchinson, uh, provided a business perspective to the brainstorming and evaluation phases of the final solution. This story will be of interest to other parks and federal agencies as the business perspective is often absent uh, in these biomimicry workshops with federal agencies. So um, this part of the story does not help us explain how to integrate biology into design, but does add valuable information about what contributed to the final design solution. So think about what stories are unique to your work so far and document these. Um, you're being asked in your homework to tell one short story about some um, challenge or a eureka moment you had. But um, I encourage you to jot down all of these important perspectives. It will make your case study unique, interesting, and applicable to others. And the more you can tell your, um, your work in a story form, the more interesting it will be to other people. Uh, one piece of information, this is um, the, the Alpine camp where we held the biomimicry workshop last time. And it has been contaminated with some kind of a tick that makes people extremely sick. <laughs> And the sand dunes uh, has decided not to let us use this site uh, because of that, because they haven't been able to um, figure out what to do with that tick. Several people stayed there last summer and ended up actually in the hospital. And I can't remember the name of the, the disease or the illness, but um, it's, it, was, it was pretty bad. So um, I'm going to be reserving uh, two of the, one or two of the um, group sites in their camp campgrounds. And uh, there's, so once um, in May, we'll send out some information about the trip. Uh, there's a nearby um, area that has, a, that has a hotel, and it also has some camper cabins available. If people didn't want to camp, there would be some additional 
uh, housing options within five miles of the site that you could also, if you want to be more comfortable. So, um, in the emulate stage, um, incorporating biology to design, once you have your um, design principles, you can move on to the creating emulation phase by incorporating biology into design. And the spark of in inspiration is euphoric, and not one would complain if after learning about a, a natural example, an idea immediately pops into the designer's mind. Um, this can be the case. But since one of the benefits of creating with biomimicry is the access to a new solution set, integration or even the method for emulation is outside the normal design process and therefore is not always obvious. It's less glamorous, <clears throat> but designers can methodically explore options for emulation. So even if an idea immediately comes to mind, it's good to be thorough and make sure no other opportunities are missed. So in other words, don't just jump to your solution space. Really go through the process of seeking those strategies from nature. So how does nature collect water? So let's look at this as an example. Um, design principles can be emulated in many ways in many circumstances. The application of a design principle can be literal or conceptual. The emulation can occur at the same scale as the original example, or it can be at a larger or a smaller scale. On the Great Sand Dunes example, we weren't looking to provide portable hydration to something as small as an insect. We were scaling it up to provide portable hydration to 300,000 humans, for example. Um, then in addition to the scale and literal or conceptual ways to emulate, there are numerous applications where the principles can be applied. The realms might be physical materials and shapes, internal communications, material assembly, environmental impact, or even external feedback loops. As an example, let's look at a building project focused on water management. The design principle abstracted from the discovery of how and why bromeliads they're epiphytic tropical plants, so they live with uh, they live as a host on another. Uh, they live connected to another plant, uh, but they don't take uh, nutrients from that plant. Um, so these bromeliads hold water, and their um, uh, pr design principles could be applied in many ways. So it, this starts with a biological story. So tank bromeliads, which are um, shown in this photograph do not get nutrients through their roots. These plants can uh, often grow high in the canopy of rainforest and do not extend their roots to the ground for support in nutrient gathering, but instead they attach to trees. As a result, they need to harness available nutrients through their aerial roots. These tank bromeliads absorb nutrients from fallen leaves and insects that decompose in the pools of water held in the bromeliads tank, and you can see that in the purple one in the upper left corner. So overlapping waxy leaves grow upward in a radical shape to form the tank. They also provide an important ecosystem service. The vermilion isn't trying to perform any service for the ecosystem, but the overall effect of a forest full of vermilions is thousands of gallons of water being held up high in the canopy layer. The tank bromeliads become a factor in the rainforest ecosystem's hydrological cycle. Instead of moving down to the forest floor and then through the soil, thus contributing to flooding, the water instead becomes trapped um, up high and water vapor can really be released in the air as it slowly evaporates. So some design principles that could be gleaned from the bromeliads is that it holds liquids in cups shaped, formed, in a cup shape formed by radical placement of waterproof materials. Um, another design principle would be access nutrients through designs that encourage the nutrients to concentrate rather than going out to gather them. Another design principle would be speed de decomposition by soaking material in water. And another design principle could be reduced flooding by capturing and holding water above the surface. So these translations are on different levels and can therefore lead to multiple expressions of the bromeliads in the project. 
A literal application of a bromeliad design principle could result in precipitation being held in tanks for use in buildings, for example. A physical application could be to use the radical shape to move water within a building. A process application could be to facilitate evaporation of excess water. A systems application could manifest as temporary holding tanks for precipitation that hold water until the city stormwater system is not overtaxed. So we can also look, um, one of the two-year certificate teams that graduated with me looked at how does nature store energy. And I'll use some of their um, examples of how they came to a solution. So um, here they biologize the question, how does nature store energy, manage chemical energy, and deliver constant voltage that was some of their bio biologizing their question. So for each challenge, um, your team can begin with a systems mapping exercise. You can map out all the components of the project, including not just the physical components, but how they are, they are connected. What are the project's inputs and outputs? How are they connected? These components and connections can all be insertion points where you can put biomimicry ideas from nature into them. Consciously naming these options as realms or design principle insertion points can bring and keep them in mind, effectively increasing the opportunities for emulation. So one of the suggested eyesight exercises for this month's homework is translate what you see to create a drawing of one system in the environment you see around you. For example, draw the system of energy flows. Use arrows, symbols, and notes like those that you would find in any, any engineering drawing. So in this eyesight exercise, you're actively observing nature and you're translating nature's principles into engineering or design language through that process. So then successful professional designers understand that design is a job and passively waiting for inspiration to, site, to strike does not always get the job done. So you probably have your own method for creating and any of or all of them may work here. So what's unique to biology is being a what's unique to biomimicry is really being true to the biology. Until you've honed your skills, it's easy to jump into the existing solution space and ignore what biology and design principles are telling you. Likewise, it's tempting to latch onto a great idea and discard the data that that mechanism might be telling you because it feels too hard to incorporate. Um, one example, I think I've explained to you the example of um, how does nature cool in um, the Colorado Rocky Mountain ecosystem, and we look to the prairie dogs um, in the ConocoPhillips site that um, HOK uh, designed buildings for, they use that uh, natural cooling techniques used by the prairie dogs uh, by orienting your, your burrows to catch the prevailing wind. But when that design idea was given to the architects and the engineers for the building, they did not, they felt it was too hard to incorporate because they had to invent a new cooling system. So they cut it out of their design, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, and what I am hearing from the biomimicry world is that's happening a lot. Even though you find the strategy in nature, it is not being incorporated because um, we don't have the technology and people don't want to invent that new technology. So a good idea, of course, still has value, but to really practice biomimicry, the biology needs to stay accurate and it needs to stay included. While you and your team members are your own best filter for this, the next stage, the evaluating phase, helps test this in an objective way. So with the ultimate goal of a sustainable design, there's really a lot to be said for the sticking to what has worked over the 3.8 billion years of evolution. So to maximize the number of ideas in the solution set, a designer can endeavor to think of an idea for every option. You can also group options from the different categories to enable even greater idea generation. For example, challenging yourself to come up with a design idea that is a literal interpretation 
at a scale larger than the original natural model and applied to each of the application realms. So you can be methodical about how you apply those um, ideas you're coming up with. The interpretation and scale components are similar for any project, but the application is specialized for each project. A business strategy project's realm for application may include communication systems, feedback loops, or some kind of exchange of goods. An industrial design project's application could include material choices, intended audience, shape, or manufacturing processes. So the example I gave earlier on the University of Wisconsin discovering about you know, self-lubricating um, materials, um, they're not looking at material choices from nature or um, manufacturing processes. They're stopping there and just using traditional materials and manufacturing processes. So they've uh, ended too soon in their evaluation. For each project, the realms where an application can occur are different. So how do you find all the potential opportunities? You may never think of every potential opportunity by consciously searching and expanding the realm of project influence, the realm where biomimicry can be applied, can continuously be enlarged. So after all the realms for application are, choosing, are chosen, combining them with different scales and interpretation. For engineering type designers, considering label the three, consider labeling the three-dimensional matrix and filling out a box with each idea for emulation. Filling in a matrix may seem a rigid way to generate new ideas, but it will greatly increase the number of ideas generated while making sure no combinations are blatantly mixed. Missed. It's also a good design practice and it broadens the design mind. So this is a, a example of um, something I looked at when I was working on biofuels. It was like how does nature, what is life's design principles for water? And um, when I was working on the biofuels, we had a we had a um, the first rendition of the uh, life's principles. So they've changed, they've been updated and refined since then. So I used um, some slightly different, but you get the point. You know, you look at nature adapts and evolves by being locally attuned and responsive, and how does nature collect, store, and distribute and use water? This will be good for the water group. <laughs> um, and we looked at the, at the uh, strategies that nature uses to perform that function. You know, um, to be locally attuned and responsive in collecting water, all water collected is locally and seasonally available sources, on-site first collection strategies rely on a minimal energy input. So that's a design principle from nature on how nature collects and stores water being locally attuned. We could look further and find specific um, um, deep principles and other um, ideas from specific organisms in the collection realm. And um, I'll bring some of this work to the insight session. The, usually the matrix are large documents, um, and I can bring the ones for biofuels and the ones for the Cuyahoga River Valley and show you how we've used the matrix to lay out all of the design ideas. So let's look quickly in evaluating. Um, evaluating is essentially ensuring that you are designing with nature in mind. It's the quality control check to assure that your design processes pass a sustainability test, as well as an audit to check for missed limits and opportunities. Ideally, life principles were specified in the scoping phase as the measurement tool, so they have legitimacy and influence to return a project to the creating phase for improvements. So once you evaluate against life's principles, if you find that you've really left out something really important, uh, you can go back to the creating phase and see if there's an opportunity to include um, uh, something that would address that life principle. Or you would identify a design flaw that you uh, need to look at in the future uh, in your evaluation phase. If the objective of the evaluation is more than just an inspection determining, determining compliance with minimum safety standards and quality standards, any evaluation can enrich a project if there is an opportunity to revisit the design and incorporate improvements. 
Audits are the most effective if occurring before the final design is implemented and allow a chance to return to the, to the design table to make necessary improvements. And I can use an example of um, our EPA building. Um, in the built environment, typical evaluation opportunities would include engineering review during the design and construction phases, um, functional aesthetic choices by the design team and the, and the client in the design phase, as well as multiple city inspections during the construction to verify conformance to safety codes. Leads or other environmentally focused certifications provide third-party confirmation of fulfilled standards. But instead of safety, something like LEEDS is, or the green, the green, the living building challenge are focused on green buildings and performance benchmarks. In industrial design, evaluation includes a feasibility assessment, material availability, safety and code compliance, and a further budgetary analysis. An evaluation list can be exhaustive and are usually project specific. In any case, they seldom are done under a full cost accounting perspective, and the scope of the evaluation is generally not broad enough to truly ensure sustainability. And so um, three or four years ago, we had an opportunity at EPA to um, put out a contract for someone to design and build a gold lead certified building that we would assure a 10-year lease on the building. And there were different teams within um, EPA that could provide input to the designer uh, to incorporate um, design criteria so that we would meet the gold lead standard. And when the plans were 75% complete, we had the advantage of um, having the National Renewable Energy Lab review those plans and what uh, their expertise brought to the table that the heating and cooling system in our building met the LEEDS point that we needed to be a gold certified building, but that it would not operate very efficiently in this climate. It was designed for a wetter climate and that we would have a LEED certified gold building that was a poor performer. In fact, we determined that it would not even qualify for our own Energy Star program. So we were able to go back and um, ask the designer to redesign that heating and cooling system to design one that was efficient as well as meeting the LEED standards. So in integrating biology into the design, um, evaluating using biomimicry is an innovative way for humans to critique their project's appropriateness. Evaluations with nature as the measurement provide higher standards than conventional measurement tools since they are based on natural models, which are functioning with their specific context as well as exemplifying life's principles. It would differ from current systems because life standards incorporate more than just the project's performance, safety, and meeting quality goals. A biomimetic Evaluation includes all those aspects plus context. Natural models are functioning in their specific context as well as exemplifying life's principles. A truly successful design should recognize the context of the planet and thrive within the operating conditions that we learned during our first webinar, that Earth runs on water, sunlight, and gravity. Earth is subject to dynamic non-equilibrium. The Earth has specific limits and boundaries, and the Earth is, operates under cyclical processes. A set of life's principles is the um, primary metrics for judging the fit or rightness of the design by asking a series of questions that look for the ecological feasibility of the proposed solution. Does the design fit within the Earth's operating conditions? Does the design draw on deep patterns and principles of the natural world? Is the design going to fo function like the other 30 million species alive today? The process of evaluation should follow the process you and your team are accustomed to, but it needs to consider the inclusion of some additional parameters or questions. This checklist may include um, the challenge is included in the, your handout challenge to biology methodology that I sent out with this week's homework, this month's homework. The checklist is 
is designed not as a yes-no kind of tool, but rather encourage you, you and your team to ask questions. How well, if all, does our design do these things? So when we look at this checklist and we compare it with the EPA building, for example, um, the building is not designed to evolve. Um, what it's, it's for a specific purpose and for a specific um, climate uh, conditions. And if those uses and conditions change, we'll have to change the building. We'll have to either tear parts of it down or re reconstruct it. Um, the building is somewhat resource uh, material and energy efficient. That was part of the design. Not everything is completely efficient, but the idea that I uh, gave to you about the heating and cooling system, um, we did look at the efficiency and made a better design. Uh, the building is unable to adapt to changing conditions, um, as we talked about. Um, the building really does not integrate development and growth. Um, it is what it is. Um, it can be used for that many people and that um, it would be very diff difficult to close off parts of the building, for example, if we had less um, growth, if we you know, lost a lot of uh, people. But it could be done. Um, it's somewhat locally attuned and responsive um, using you know, some of the ideas I already mentioned. Uh, and then we did use life-friendly chemistry. That was a design principle that no toxic materials would be used in the manufacture or the building of that building. So um, even just looking at this checklist when we designed our own building did in fact help improve some of the things, but it would have been a, a better design if we had looked at it all. So the benefits of integrating biology into design, uh, we looked at the benefits of evaluating. Um, you can identify missed opportunities, pre and ask what would nature do. And a biology-based evaluation would improve the evaluating stage by bringing all those survival strategies that we find in nature. If your, des if your design does not match a guideline well or at all, this needs to be addressed by reconsidering this guideline again in the creating phase. However, as you go through the evaluation process and find your design is not holding up against life principles very well across the board, you may need to revisit the scoping phase and perhaps your function and context were not clearly or properly defined. Or perhaps you did not accurately distill the deep design principles from the creating phase. By scrutinizing your design in this way, you are essentially pre-testing it for success in the big picture and in the long run. You may discover that your emulation of nature was actually very shallow. It's tempting and rather easy to crudely mimic the shape or pattern in nature, ignoring the function and context. Be wary of this tendency. Abstracting and emulating an abstracted design principle moves the design process away from the slavish copying of nature, which is a frequent point of criticism from some biomimicry objectors. And an alternative approach to the checklist is to build the matrix of life's principles against the function of your design, like I showed you with the water um, example. By systematically filling out the entire matrix for how each aspect of the design follows each of life's principles, you can easily identify areas of weakness and strength and address those appropriately. This type of evaluation really takes a significant amount of time but does, not, but does ensure that your evaluation is objective and thorough. In the work I did with the Cuyahoga River Valley, we spent the majority of our time filling out an enormous matrix because we had a lot of functions that we wanted to address, both in the um, uh, economic, uh, social, and environmental realms of the project. Uh, and then we were able to take that matrix and, and extract our solutions from that. So it was a good way to organize natural strategies. If the success of your project has high stakes, it's worth taking the time to undergo, undergo this process or do some limited amount of uh, matrix design. Um, so lastly, you ask the question, what 
wouldn't nature do? And the answer to this question can provide incredible foresight in anticipating where limits have been inappropriately exceeded or strategies that are likely to fail under one parameter or another. Imagine for a moment what our world would look like today if many of our current unsustainable designs were forced to undergo the question of what nature wouldn't do prior to being set upon the world. Now, Imagine if every design from here forward was able to confidently perform and reach each of nature's guidelines. And such a world that's empowered by life's principles, design genius, sounds pretty good to me. And here's an example. The, there's a City of the Future competition um, that's held for architects um, each year. And this is one I pulled off the internet that HOK did. They took the current um, Freedom Parkway today into Atlanta, Georgia. And they redesigned it because we need to repurpose our current um, infrastructure. We are not just going to knock down all of Atlanta and rebuild it in according to biomimicry principles. But you can see that uh, what they've done to redesign it um, for 100 years in the future, um, you know, they've opened up open space. They've allowed for uh, uh, more of the functions of the city that were removed to be uh, reapplied maybe as building skins, uh, maybe encapsulating transportation in a tube. It looks like they've opened up some open space. So um, when you ask the question, how would nature design a city, uh, you can get some pretty amazing answers. So that concludes the uh, creating and evaluating phase. And I'll see if anybody has any questions. Any questions? I haven't gotten any quite yet. Well, there's still time. <laughs> okay. Well, let me go ahead and talk about the homework. It's due on June 14th. Um, so the homework this time you have, uh, we have two team introductions, and I've already received the um, PowerPoint from the Communicate team. So we need the um, homework from the um, ADAPT team. We need the team introductions from the team ADAPT uh, to be presented next time. Um, I've asked you to review the Challenge to Biology worksheet and start one for your own challenge. So you've completed some of the initial steps in the Challenge to Biology methodology by identifying the function and context for your challenge. And um, the one I've attached to the homework is an uh, example from the Great Sand Dunes. Um, so as a team, review and discuss this methodology. Uh, fill in the parts that your team has already completed and biologize your functions. Another piece of your homework is to tell a story. Um, once your team has found a solution for your challenge, your experiences will really be valuable for other working in the field of biomimicry or those considering using the biomimicry approach. And I'll tell you that um, a lot of people are very interested in what um, government agencies and other designers are doing around biomimicry. And so these um, case studies where we really applied it even if it doesn't result in a good solution, we can say we tried this approach and it didn't work that well. It's a good um, way to spread that information around. So these kind of case studies will be very valuable. So it's really important to document your progress, your mistakes, your eureka moments, and other thoughts um, as you progress. Um, it will serve as good notes for when you do your case study. So what I'm asking you to do for next year, next month, is to write a paragraph, something pretty short, about some part of your process to date, either about um, your challenges of forming a team, identifying your function or context, or even some problems or um, good benefits of using the webinar approach. It doesn't matter uh, what part of this process is documented. And I'm going to ask one member of each team just to read that short story to the group during our uh, June 21st webinar. So you don't really need to submit anything for that. Just um, decide within your team what um, um, story you want to tell uh, and who's going to tell the story. Um, I've asked you to go on to asknature.org. Um, you will be using Ask Nature as one of the places to discover strategies from nature to perform your function or functions. 
So log into the web page if you haven't done so to date and go through the tutorial and practice using the site. Um, at the end of May, um, EPA Region 8 has hired an uh, EPA intern, uh, Nestle, and she'll begin a 12-week assignment in our office and will and will assist teams in accessing biological information on organisms that perform the functions your team has identified. And she's uh, currently a student, so she'll have access to university research and work through the EPA library to find all those examples of how nature is performing those functions. If you want to move ahead, start finding strategies in the biological literature. Uh, next month's webinar will include instructions on how to abstract the deep design principles from these strategies. And you'll, your team will be asked to take one example um, that you have found either in Ask Nature or through other educational um, um, websites or gotten from Nestle. And in July webinar, um, present some one of the abstracted principles. Uh, I provided a short video. It's less than five minutes. It was really inspiration to me, inspirational to me, and it communicates the cycle of change in, in nature and relates it to human change. Um, continue with your eyesight, and I've um, offered a couple of new ideas on how you could look at your eyesight. So we've covered a lot of information about how to use biomimicry methodology. Uh, we've looked at the design advantages and flaws in the LEED certification for the EPA building. <coughs> um, and we've looked at uh, the Great Sand Dunes as one example of how to develop case studies. So um, teams with biologists or other scientists as members will have an easier time with this month's homework. Um, but uh, this is a real opportunity to learn about more about each discipline and their role in biomimicry. And I'll, that's the end of my webinar, and I'll open it up for comments or questions. Um, one question, Marie. I was <clears throat> wondering, as you were going through your presentation, you had that um, great matrix for, that was um, for water um, with what the different functions were. And I was wondering if you had um, a template for that. Um, I don't have a template. Um, it's just really, I just, and I'm really bad with computer programs. So <laughs> what I did is just put a table. And I okay. can send that slide to the um, water group okay. as a starting like, yeah. And um, I'll have more, um, I'll, I'll bring the, the matrix end up end up being very large spreadsheets. So I'll bring those to the in-person session in September. Great. And I also wanted to, just one comment, that um, if you want to access this um, PowerPoint presentation, we will post it, or this recorded presentation, sorry, we will post it within a couple of days. But I spaced out and forgot to record it for about 20 minutes. So <laughs> it's, we missed the beginning section, which is, um, I think it was through our the team water introduction um, and our slides. And then uh, I think I remembered after that. So it is missing a bit at the beginning, but um, it should have the bulk of what you need. Would you like me to send out the introductory slides from the two teams to the group? Sure. Yeah, sure. We, we can post those. Because that was the beginning part. Yes, you're right. <laughs> All righty. Any okay. other questions or comments from anybody online? Oh, yeah. Someone, um, then I was just asking if we can get a copy of, um, of, your, of your slides, Marie, too. And I wonder, those are probably really big to, um, to right. email out. But I wonder if uh, maybe on our website, if, if you and I could do a kind of a a Dropbox or you share it or something like that, and I can I can get those presentations and just post those as a separate line item. And let um, me so. see a lot of the inf well the information I'm presenting is in a is from a, a workbook that the biomimicry group is actually selling. So I'm not let me ask them how much oh. of, they don't mind me talking about it and presenting it as the design strategy, but once you publish it on the internet, then it's just out there. So I've been reluctant in the past to send out my slides to anyone. Okay. Um, I feel like I took the core piece of information and put it in that 
document um, the methodology, uh, document the um, challenge to biology that I sent out. Uh, so that kind of explains it. Okay. I think more about that. And if there are specific requests from people on, um, on some of this information, let me know. And maybe I can find a, a, a non-copyrighted or protected way to send that out. Okay. Right, any other questions? I think that's it for today, Marie. Okay, well, thanks to everybody. And um, if you have any uh, questions or comments, just email me, and uh, we'll um, get together again next month. Good luck. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good June.